ahead. So we did this one, and we began this one yesterday. And we had to finish part C, the boiled potatoes. And part C says for 10, or for T being less than 10, an alternate model for the internal temperature of the potato at T equals T minutes. Is the function g that satisfies the differential equation where g of t is measured in blah, 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 blah. We still have our initial condition. Do I have a writing device? I do, but I want fuchsia. There's our initial condition. We need to find an expression for g of t, and then we need to use that g of t model to find the temperature of the potato at time t equals 3. Okie dokie. So, we need to take our, I'm going to try to organize here, our dg dt equals negative g minus 27 to the 2 thirds power. And what do you need to do first? Separate, right? If you do not separate, I got my thing here, you're going to get a big fat 0 for 5 out of this bad boy, I think it is. That's just a big hitter. No separation of variables, you get zero out of five. So we're going to separate, <coughs> and here's my g. That, see that negative 27, that constant is stuck with g. So we're going to say 1 over, or I'm going to say, g minus 27 to the 2 thirds dg equals negative dt. I have separated, and because I am a simpleton, I'm going to look at this as g minus 27 to the negative two-thirds power dg equals negative dt, then I'm going to integrate both sides. Because it's not a natural log over there on the left. Because it's got that exponent. If the exponent on that were 1, it would be a natural log, but it's not. So we come down and we say, okay, we've got our g minus 27. If we add 1 to that power, we get a third, right? And then we need to say, hmm, we need a 1 divided by a third. We're going to get a 3 out here, right? That equals a negative t. Please, if you forget your c, if you forget to write plus c, you will get a maximum of 2 or 5 points no matter what you do here, okay? And then we need to solve for g or find c first. What do you want to find first? Because I don't have a natural log in here, personally, I would find c first. And our initial condition was 0, 0,91. Yep. It was 0, 0,91. So I'm going to say 3 times 91 minus 27, 1 third equals 0 plus c. What's 91 minus 27? That'd be a 64. Did I do that right? I think I did that right. Equals, that's a third. Equals C. Remember, that's just a cubed root, right? The third power is really cubed root of 64. So the cubed root of 64 is what? 4 times 3, so C better be 12. Then we're going to take our C, and we're going to say 3 times G minus 27 to the 1 third power equals negative T plus 12, and then we got to solve for G. which means I'm going to divide everything by 3 quick, right? So then I'm going to say, okay, this is really a cubed root of g minus 27 equals negative 1 third t plus 4. I'm hence going to cube both sides, right? So I get a big old g minus 27 equals negative a third t plus 4 cubed. i got to add my 27 over, so my g in terms of t is going to equal negative one-third t plus four cubed plus 27. We found our g. I hope I found my, my hand is sore. Then they want us to find g of three. 
which equals negative one third times three plus four, three plus 27. Well, what does that give me? Other than a headache, negative one plus four, that gives me three cubed, right? So that gives me 27 plus 27. Is that right? Yeah. So my G of three equals 54 degrees Celsius is the potato. Yep. Four degrees Celsius. Over half of the points for that whole free response problem. Remember, each one's worth nine. And just to sound like a broken record. If you do not separate, you get nada out of five. How do you know exactly how to tell you to separate the variables? To separate the variables. That is part of what they're testing you on. Bottom line, you ever, if they ever ask you to solve a differential equation, think separate variables first. Sometimes, sometimes you will have like dy dx equals, I, I don't know, say 3x. Really not a lot of separation needed here because the whole thing's in terms of x. But I would automatically, I would separate right away and I would separate any differential equation and your butt is covered on it. Okay. Half the time, actually, I'm going to say more than half, I'm going to say 99.9% .9 of the time, they are not going to say separate the variables that integrate. They're going to say find the function. They're kind of mean that way. They got a little cat in the blood. Then <laughs> we got two particles moving along the x-axis or TV between 0 and 8. The, I'll be honest, when I did this one the other night, I screwed this up because I didn't read closely. The position of particle P. This is a position function. And Kruger didn't look at his position function. He was being stupid. While the velocity of Q is given V of Q. Okay? So X of P position. Particle P is at position 5 at time 0. For T B in between 0 to 8, when is the particle P moving to the left? That's simply asking when is the derivative on 0 to 8 negative, right? So your first point is going to come from, well, we need to find VP of T is going to equal, well, it's a natural log, so it's the derivative of the business divided by the business, and then we need to find out when that equals zero, right? Well, does the denominator factor at all? It doesn't, or you can kind of look at it like cross multiplying goes out. Because it doesn't factor, these are going to be or if you look really quick, think of b squared minus 4ac. Those are going to be imaginary solutions down there. So don't waste time on them. Um, so we know this equals 0 when t equals 1. Right? Velocity is 0 when t equals 1. So we're going to set up. Our number line, I think, from 0 to 8, and our, I'm going to put a 1 here. We're 0 here. Well, I can put a 0 in my derivative to test this out real easy, because it's not a critical value. So if I put 0 in there, I get negative 2 over 10, so I'm negative there. And if I put a 2 or anything bigger, as a matter of fact, I can put an 8 in there, I'm going to get a positive number on the top. I'm going to get 64. I'm going to get a positive number on the bottom. So I'm moving right there, right? You're just checking your sign is all you're doing. Therefore, the particle is moving left 
on, I hope, 0 to 1, because Vp of t is less than 0 on that interval. Yes, sir? So, like in the entropy, they have like a like, tick like for like the 0. Don't worry about them. So that they wanted the, they wanted the, uh, well, for that. I have been told in the past, when you're writing an interval notation, the only time you have to be accurate between parentheses and brackets is if you're stating a domain or a range. When you're talking intervals increasing, decreasing, and any, any of that, they always write them correctly on the rubrics, but they're not going to downgrade you. I've been told for that. Any questions? How many points is that first one worth? Two? Yep, two. Push one was worth two points. We got all two of them. One is finding your derivative, and one is your interval that you're moving left. I went. Further, they didn't say justify your answer, so you didn't have to say that at the end, but it's pretty intelligent to say that. Find all the times t during which the two particles travel in the same direction. Well, in your work, you would still have this 0, 1, 8 for your vp of t being positive and negative, eh, we did that backwards, being, being negative here and positive here, so you're moving left here and you're moving right here. So we need to come back to our other one, particle Q. When is particle Q? Because that was the velocity now. We need to find out when that's zero. Well, does that factor? Bet you it does. So that gives me a, a t minus 5 and a t minus 3 to give me my 8. That's a 0. So when t equals 5 and when t equals 3, the particle equals 0. Hence, I'm going to come underneath here. This is the easiest way to do this. And I'm going to say this is going to be my uh, bq. Vq of t, and we're at 0, we're going to be at 3, we're going to be at 5, we're going to be at 8, here I'm 0, here I'm 0. So if I put 0, I get a negative times a negative. I'm moving right there, if I put a 4 in here, I get a negative times a positive. Moving left there, if I put a 6 or an 8 in there, I get two positives, which means I'm moving right again. And then just check it out. When are they moving the same direction? And you're just going to kind of go. Nah, 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 nah. When are they moving the same direction? One? No. Yeah. One to three, then five to eight. Say one to three. Throw that last little end in there because the signs are the same. That's how we know they're moving the same direction. You didn't ask for that. Sometimes you might say, when are they both moving right? And you just got to be sign um, conscientious. Find the acceleration of particle Q at time 2. If the speed of particle Q is increasing, oh wait, is the speed of particle Q increasing or decreasing or neither at time t equal 2? Explain your reasoning. So, we need the acceleration of Q. We better be finding AQ of t, right? Which AQ of t is going to just be 2t minus 8. So this is going to equal when t minus 4, so when t equals 4, correct? Then I'm going to come on here and I'm going to say, I'm going to go 0, 8, 
I'm going to slap my 4 in there. And here I'm 0. If I put a 0 in here, I'm going to have a negative times a positive. So that's negative, right? Actually, that doesn't matter. We just need to find, I don't, I don't need any of that. I just need AQ of 2. <clears throat> AQ of 2 is going to give me, what, negative 4? Is that right? And I also need VQ of 2. VQ of 2 is going to give me what? It's going to give me 4 minus 16 plus 15. Did I do that right? Which, would that be 3? Right? That equals 3. So is it speeding up or slowing down? Slowing down. Why is it slowing down? Because explain your reasoning here. Slowing down because AQ of T and VQ of, I'm not going to say T, I'm going to say 2, the point they're talking about, of 2 are different sides. Which implies they are working against each other. Slow down, right? Then we go find the position of particle Q the first time it changes direction. Well, this is going to come back to particle Q. When did the, when's the first time it changed direction? We never did that yet, did we? Did we find that for Q? For Q? Oh yeah, we did. There it is. So it changed direction at what? The first time it changed direction was 3 because it changed sign at 3. So Q Okay, so change direction first. Now, how are we going to find its position at time t equals 3? What? We're going to take our initial position of 5 plus your integral of what? t squared minus 8t plus 15 dt from 0 to 3, then you're actually going to integrate that. You're going to say 5 plus, get a t cubed with a third, minus a t squared with a 4, plus a 15t from 0 to 3. Thank you, lower limit of 0 again, right? So we get 5 plus, we're going to take the top, minus, thank you, 0 for the bottom, put a 3 in there. We'll just see that as 3 times 3 times 3. One of those 3's is canceled out by the third, so we get a 9 minus that 36 plus 45, 15, 45. Oh, God. So I take minus 36 here. No, I wouldn't. I would say I'd add that, and I'd say I got 54 minus 36. Am I doing this correctly? Or... 14, would that give me what? 8? 18? So would it be 5 plus 18? Yeah. To get me a position of 23 is the position of Q. That wasn't bad, was it? I like the part of it. I, they used to scare the crap out of me. <clears throat> then we come to another graph. Graphs are recurring themes, particle motions, recurring themes. And <clears throat> let f be the function defined by, so here's f. 
and let g be a differentiable function, the table gives values of g. Select values h as a function, well, whose graph consists of five line segments shown in the figure. So there's h. Oh boy, I've got three different functions. Find the slope of the line tangent to the graph of f at pi. Okay. That's not too bad. We gotta find the derivative of that first, correct? Derivative of this, derivative of cosine something is negative sine something, chain rule times the derivative of my something, plus e to the something is e to the something times the derivative of my something. So that should be my derivative. Then I gotta come back and I gotta find, okay, well what's f prime of pi? Hmm. Negative two, sine 2 pi plus cosine pi e sine pi. What's the sine of 2 pi? Times negative 2 is 0 plus what's the cosine of pi? Negative 1. E. What's the sine of pi? 0. So what's this bugger equal? F prime of pi equals negative 1. Oh gosh, yeah. Remember like that first one I gave you that was like six pages long? You don't? Yeah, you're going to have... Do I have one of those here yet? This is, that's the one I couldn't put on... I don't have an extra one here. But yeah, you're going to get all kinds of room to work, Catherine. It's going to be part A, here's a big block of work, and then part B is another big block of work. Kind of like if you go through your stuff, like the very first free response we did, it's going to be just laid out like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah, and they're going to give you all kinds of work. And if you already found an answer in part A like we did before, you do not need to recalculate it. You can go up, grab it, and bring it up. Let k be the function defined by k of x equals h of f of x. Find k prime of pi. They are testing. Can you find the derivative of a composition function? And k prime of x is the derivative of the outside with the inside in it times the derivative of the inside. It's your composition function. If you're like, what? Well, think if you have 2x squared. That is 2 times the inside function drop to power 1 times the derivative inside. That's the chain for a composition function. Come on now, go away. I don't want any garbage on it. Then we got to say, okay, we got to find k prime of pi. Well, this is going to be h prime of f of pi times f prime of pi. Son of a biscuit licker anyways. We found this one. We found f prime of pi before, didn't we? We found f prime of pi in part A was negative 1. This is going to be h prime. We need to find f of pi. Pi. So I'm going to say f of pi equals cosine 2 pi plus e to the sine pi, which gives me... Cosine of 2 pi? Uh, 1. Uh -huh. 1 plus e to the sine pi. Sine pi is 0. So that gives me e to the 0, which gives me 1 plus 1, which gives me 2 for f of pi, right? Now, i got to know what the heck is h prime of 2. Mm. Here's my graph of h. I gotta go to two. What is the slope of H? Because it's the derivative. What's the slope of H at two? Negative one third. 
So this equals negative 1 third times negative 1 k, not h, come on, k prime of pi better be equaling a third. And if you're curious, I know Wager's both curious, but she's not in. Part 1's worth two points, part B's worth two points. One for finding uh, the derivative, and actually part A is just finding what f prime of pi is. Part 2 is finding your derivative and then finding the answer. Then we go to part C. M is defined by G of negative 2x times h of x, find m prime of 2. Bill? Yes. These are closed down here because people are vandalizing, so you got to go all the way down. The <laughs> They've been shut down for like a week now. So, yeah. So, now they are testing, do you know how to take the derivative of a composition function with a product? This is a composition function in here. This is g of something times something. So we got to take m prime of x is going to equal, first it's a product, so it's the derivative of the first term. Well, that's g prime with negative 2x left in it times the chain rule of negative 2 times the first term, h of x, plus... The derivative of the second term, which is going to be h prime of x times the first term, which happens to be g of negative 2x. These are fun. I love these kinds of problems. They're just meticulous little buggies. Which gives me, now they want me to find m prime of 2. Well, that's going to give me g prime of negative 4 times negative 2, times h of 2, plus h prime of 2, times g of negative 4. Right? What? So i got to come back here and i got to say, okay, what's g of negative 4? Oh, that's nice. Here's my g function. Here's my... Negative 4, so g of negative 4 is negative 1, right out of my table. So this gives me negative 1 times negative 2 times h of 2. h of 2, well here's h, h of 2. What's the value of h of 2? Negative 2 thirds. Anybody, anybody have a question? They're going to pull this crap on you too. Because this is going through the origin here, we know this piece of the function, h of x, just between 0 and 3, we know that's going to equal the slope, which is negative 2 thirds x plus 0. y equals mx plus b. And if I need to know what it is at, uh, actually it's a third, I'm sorry, I got that all jacked up. Oh, son of a biscuit right here. Ah. Drop 1, run 3, it's negative 1 third x. And if we need h of 2, it's just h of, put a 2 in there, that's negative 2 thirds. It's all mental math, you do not need to show that work. But that's how you're finding that value, because you know the equation of the line quickly. So this is negative 2 thirds plus h prime of 2, we found that before, didn't we? Yeah, we just did, that's negative third. That's negative one third times g of four. G of four, there it is, it's five. That's five. So this gives me negative four thirds minus five thirds, right? Which gives me negative nine thirds. So m prime of two is negative 3. Right? Look at all those values for g that are completely worthless for you. Those mean suckers. Then we go on to 
part D. And this goes back to your question you had yesterday, how do we know about this? Is there a number C in the closed interval, negative 5 to negative 3, such that G prime of C equals negative 4, justify your answer? This is mean value theorem. Okay? The first thing, okay, so for what you asked the other day, how do you know where to look, to be honest with you? Check the overall slope of the of the uh, interval they're giving you before you look inside and find it. So, is there a number? Well, first and foremost, we're talking about g, and g is a differentiable function. Okay, I, I'm not even going to get to that yet, but we're going to find g of negative three minus g of negative 5 over negative 3 minus negative 5. This is our mean value theorem that we're doing, which is going to give me, I guess I got a couple more, g of negative 3, that's 2 minus 10, right? g of negative 3 is 2, negative 5 is 10, so I'm going to get 2 minus 10 over, right, right? 2, which gives me negative 8 over 2, which gives me negative 4. And I just check the slope over the entire interval. And then I say, because g is differentiable, it is also continuous. Because g is differentiable, and I should really, on the table, it's, it's continuous. Therefore, by the mean value theorem, there does exist some c such that I'm going to use a capital G. That does it. Is a big G or a little G? It's a big G, isn't it? That doesn't matter. It's a big G. Such that G prime of C equals negative 4 on negative 5 plus negative 3. Because the average slope equals the instantaneous slope within the interval, and g is differentiable and continuous on that interval, the mean value theorem guarantees that happens at least once. Could happen six, seven times, but it guarantees at least once. Questions on that one? What about them? What do you mean, where would it be going to that? Negative 4 is going to fall somewhere between there because the average slope from negative 3 to 5 or negative 5 to negative 3, the average slope is negative 4. And because it's continuous and differentiable, it's going to exist between there. It doesn't have to show up in here. This is just giving you the slope at this point, the tangent line at this point, the tangent line at this point. But your graph could look something like this, okay? They're giving you this slope, they're giving you, um, and it continues on and giving you this slope. It just guarantees that Somewhere in there, this average slope exists somewhere. <coughs> That's all the mean value theorem shows you. Then, hey, that ends that one. Oh boy. 
Now I gotta pull my other one up. I didn't pull that one up yet, sorry. Uh, where are you? Okay, hey, we're getting closer. All right. <clears throat> Calculator active. Water is pumped into a tank at a rate by 2,000 meters or something. Hey. Uh, so, tell me what you know about this function before I even go on. It's an exponential function. Are exponential functions continuous? Are exponential functions smooth everywhere? Therefore, there's an implication for you to understand without them stating that W of T is <laughs> continuous and differentiable across its entire domain. Because they gave me the function. Same with polynomial. It's the same with sine and cosine. Tangent and cotangent, are they continuous and differentiable across their entire domain? Tangent and cotangent? No, they have vertical asymptotes. They are not continuous and differentiable across their entire domain, but they are within reason, okay? So that's an implication that you need to keep your, your parent functions in mind with, okay? And liters per hour, or as measured in hours, water is removed from the tank modeled by R of T liters, where R, see now they're not giving us a function, they're giving us a table of values, but now they're saying R is differentiable. And if it's differentiable, it's continuous. So it's going to be taking on all kinds of values in here, right? Selected values for R or T are shown in the table. At time T equals zero, there are 50,000 liters of water in the tank. Estimate R prime of two. Notice, R prime of two is going to equal. Two is right between there, isn't it? So we are going to take R of three minus R of one over three minus one. And this is calculator active for you. So R of 3 is going to be 950 <laughs> minus 1190 divided by 2, which is, what is 950 minus 1190? 240? Negative 240? Negative 240 divided by 2. Therefore, R prime of 2 is going to equal negative 120. Piece of cake, right? Yeah, um, indicate units of measure. Most definitely we do. Because they explicitly said they need to be there. And they gave me units of measure, so I better not circle that dirty rotten scoundrel. What are my units of measure? Liter, liters per hour squared, because these are liters, see this is where Kruger screwed up yesterday, didn't I? These are liters per hour divided by hours. This is going to be liters per hour squared. That's a bad squared, but it's squared. And you can say liters per hour per hour, or you can say liters per hour squared, and they'll be happy. Okay? Use a left Riemann sum with four subintervals indicated by the table. Estimate the total amount of water removed from the tank during the eight hours. So they're asking you, would you, could you please estimate zero to eight of R of T dt? That's what they want us to get, right? <coughs> Except we are explicitly doing this using a left Riemann sum with four subintervals. So. 
I've got one subinterval, two subintervals, three subinterval, and there's my fourth subinterval. And I'm going to take this and I'm going to say this equals, remember the width or your distance in x is this is going to be one times. We're using the left endpoint, 1340, plus my width of the red one is going to be 2 times the left endpoint of 2, 1190, plus green is going to be 3 times my left height, plus green is going to be 2 times my left endpoint of 740. And it's calculator active, and you're going to type with those little buggers right into your calculator. And you're going to get how much? Eighty fifty liters. Okay, is this an overestimate or an underestimate of the total amount of water removed? Give a reason for your answer. Well, back here they told me we're differentiable and decreasing. So if I'm decreasing, it's an overestimate because R of T is decreasing and we used left end points. What? What do you mean? That will not change it because it's continuous and differentiable and they just give you a few values of R of T across and we're using those few values to estimate. So my first rectangle is technically, or now are you asking me, what do you mean by what, if it's skipped? So we're basically taking this rectangle times, this one's a little wider, oops, that's bad, times this one was three units wide, and then the last one was like two units wide. So we're still finding the area, but we're overestimating that area using the left hand. If, if you like, if you if you didn't use the first one, you're saying it's still going to be an overestimate though because you're using the left end point and it's decreasing. Okay, that one is worth three points. Finding your left Riemann sum work, your estimate and your overestimate with reason. Use your answer from part B to find an estimate of the total amount of water in the tank to the nearest liter at the end of eight hours. Okay? Well, in a sense, not in a sense, this is asking us, we have, we started with 50,000 liters in there, right? And then water is pumped into the tank at this rate, so plus the integral from 0 to 8 of WT dt, and then we are going to subtract our 8050 liters to get how many liters are in, <coughs> excuse me, in there. Yeah, I can get the answers over here, but I didn't do this last night because I fell asleep. 49, 786 liters, two points, one for your integral, one for your estimate. Okay. So I was thinking about this one this morning, Kayla, that you asked me on yesterday here. Okay. And it's kind of a wonky. So for between 
T being between 0 and 8, is there a time T at which the water is pumped into the tank at the same rate? Remember I said yesterday this is going to be an intermediate value theorem. Is there intermediate value theorem is simply an existence theorem? It says, hey, if I have this point here and it's 2 comma uh, 1, and I have this point up here, and it's 50 comma 100. If I'm continuous and differentiable, I am guaranteed every value from 1 to 100 exists on this function between. That's what the intermediate values are. All the intermediate values between the, the low one and the high one exist. Because you're continuous and different. Okay? So it's a matter of the or It just really needs to be continuous. It doesn't need to be differentiable. It just needs to be continuous because differentiability isn't going to play into the intermediate value. So, is there a time t at which the water pumped into the tank is the same as the rate at which the water is being removed? So, like I said yesterday, this is telling me when, or this is asking me actually, let me go this quicker. This is asking me is R of t equal to W of t, or vice versa. And it really should not matter, except I'm going to say, is the water being pumped in? exactly the same as the water going out. The rate at which the pump water is being pumped into the tank is the same. So I'm going, is in ever the same as out? Well, if in, if these are the same, water coming in minus water going out is the same as equaling zero, right? And I kind of got to go after this in this way. Because I want to know, are they going to intersect? So I want to see them as an equation. And <clears throat> here's where the part here, W of T, and I'm going to say W of T is continuous. And it's continuous because it's an exponential function. R of T is differentiable. Therefore, continuous differentiability implies continuity. Therefore, W of T minus R of T is also continuous. If both functions are continuous, their difference are continuous. Subtract two of them, okay? So if I took, at the beginning, because we're looking for between 0 to 8, if I took W of 0 minus R of 0, what is that going to equal? Well, W of 0 is 2,000, right? Because that's my initial condition. That's 2,000 minus R of 0 is 1340, okay, it's going to equal what? 660, which is greater than 0. What is W of 8 minus R of 8? Here's where you got to type into your calculator function, and you're going to find the value of w at 8. I don't know what it is, but I do know the value of w at, or at r is 700. So this is going to be something minus 700. So what is, did anybody get w of 8? Anybody get it? Okay, then I'm going to find it. And I'm going to come here and I'm going to say a calculator. And I'm going to say, what is 2,000 times e to the negative 8 squared? So can I just call that 64? 
and then it's divided by 20, right? 64 divided by 20 approximates that answer. It's 81.52 something. And then I'm going to say minus, what was it, 74? No, 700. And that's going to give me negative 680. So I'm going to say 81.52. So I'm going to come over here and I'm going to say 81.52. This equals negative, you don't have to show the number, but what was it? 618. Negative 618-ish, 618, which is less than zero. Therefore, somewhere between there, therefore, by the intermediate value theorem, R W w of t minus r of t has to equal zero, which implies, so w of t has to equal r of t at some point. Zero to eight. Does that make sense? Billy? Really? Is there explicitly a talk about the intermediate value theorem? I believe you probably do. Um, That's great if you don't remember the name of it. Well, if you explain it, well, because this went from negative to positive, I had to cross the x axis, which means it equals zero. I think that would suffice, to be honest okay. with you. This just gets through. There's two big ones you guys will use. Intermediate value theorem for a description, and I honestly remember on almost every AP exam there is a mean value theorem used as a justification. So 